my friends. Uh, it's time for some questions. We've got a lot of uh, interesting ones here today. Uh, and thank you all very much for sending them in. Uh, I really appreciate them. Like I've told you, it's uh, it's always useful to me, at least, to think about some of these things that I otherwise wouldn't think about. Karen uh, Baldas, Baldas, Baldasser. Karen Baldasser. Karen um, says, based on the One Field movie, how feasible would it be to contact various houses of worship and ask them to dedicate a window of time to world peace and prayer and meditation each week during their service? I think that would be an admirable thing to do. Everything is, um, you know, in that space is is, is admirable. But uh, the the basic notion uh presumes that the um the problem is essentially outside of us and can be solved from the outside i.e by some supreme being that uh more or less that uh you know we're praying outside to somehow get help for all of this i guess i'm uh i i remember when uh, my friend Willis Harmon, who used to be the president of the Institute of Noet Noetic Sciences, he wrote a book uh, years ago called uh, Global Mind uh, Change, I think he called it, Global Mind Change. And essentially the argument was that you don't get any uh, major change on this planet if you don't have a mind shift that happens that's so that you see the world in a different way. You see yourself and you see the world in a different way. And that is far more, I would guess, that that would be a far more effective kind of focus uh, to try, which, of course, contributes to this evolutionary jump to try to get people to start to come up to this level, this expanded awareness to where you see yourself and you see this reality in a broader, more bigger, inclusive kind of way. And that... Um, probably in practical terms, I would guess, would be uh, perhaps more uh, more effective. But thank you for your kind comments. So Palmer says, I have heard that the only problems in the world <clears throat> is the idea of being separate from anything. At least I believe we are all one. So we're back at the uh, idea of uh, it's all that we're all one. He he has a um, angle on this, though, and he says... Uh, if we could teach this from birth, do you think that it would change humanity to move to a higher level of consciousness that we all yearn for? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, in the same way that they're teaching uh, kids all this woke stuff and it's now gotten to the place where it's turning into policy and states and governments and institutions and corporations and all that kind of stuff, you could do the same thing. If you had, uh, I've always thought that there's about a half a dozen kind of basic principles that uh, if we all had internalized them, that we would be able to make uh, effective kind of major decisions about anything because we would know that you need to treat somebody like you treat yourself or whatever the, those are. There, there aren't many of them. And, uh, and certainly this whole idea of oneness would be one. So if, if kids uh, were raised to see themselves and see themselves as an integral part of the environment and the uh, rest of humanity and so on, that would uh, certainly color all the rest of their lives. Uh, certainly before the age seven, if you started to get people to realize, uh, kids to realize that. And uh, that would be uh, a very important uh, initiative uh, in this new world that uh, that is coming along. Kathy Adamski says Trump's son is asking for suggestions for his staff. John, would you be willing or interested? Your character is proven, <laughs> and it's time this country came into the twenty first century. Well, you're kind and sweet to suggest that. I've already 
I played that game. I worked in the White House. I did those kinds of things, and uh, and that's uh, and I'm I'm past that. I got other things that I have to do. Uh, thank you, though. Uh, which is not to say that the really good people uh, shouldn't try to put themselves in those kinds of positions because we all have our own job to do. We all have our own kind of objective in life and it changes at different stages in life. And so I was quite excited when I went down there the first time and I don't need to do that again. Thank you. Uh, it, it's complicated because it's very, it's not simple. The idea that a president can make these sweeping changes and the, the it's just, you, you, you got to understand the bureaucracy and the layers upon layers and millions of people all below who can drag their feet and all kinds of things. And so you need a global mind shift. You need this switch you need some big catalytic event that's halfway scares everyone to death and then they stand up and say man we're not going to do that again and now you've got an opening to go in a new direction and eh, then come and ask me and then maybe we can have, have, have a different answer then and kathy adamski is back i'm a third through listening to david roger webb's detailed audio book the taking on youtube this is a very important book that i think uh, everybody ought to you can uh, you can get it in a pdf free he's got uh, a number of videos over he's giving talks about it which are really galvanizing and interesting and the basic notion is that uh, that they have uh, uh, systematically set up the whole financial system that they can take anything that uh, is held in digital form by an intermediary. So if you've got a mortgage on a, on a house and the mortgage is digital and it's held by a bank or a mortgage company or something like that, uh, or stocks and bonds, which you don't hold, that they're held by a brokerage firm or something like that. But he says that the, that the laws have all been put in place to be able to, when the big fight, when the collapse comes, that they can instantaneously and automatically sweep all the equity, all the assets, the ownership out of these uh, institutions and move them up to the higher level of the, whoever the bigger guys are who own the banks or the mortgage company or the whatever. And so all the guys at the bottom get screwed. Uh, and uh, it's very uh, compelling. It's a very, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he makes the case very, very strongly about how it's all been put together and it's all in place and that they effectively done it multiple times in the past in different ways, but have done the same thing that, pump and dump and, and clean it all out. Um, Terry uh, McNeil says, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on the Mandela effect. Uh, uh, that's interesting and timely that you'd ask that because I just had one a while back. Uh, I was, uh, I read a book. I heard it in a, I listen to audiobooks when I drive on long on road trips, and I was listening to an audiobook about uh, the Royal Navy back in the you know, late 1700s, early 1800s. And uh, they described uh, how this a ship in a big storm, uh, which was trying to run away from somebody that was chasing them, uh, how that the captain's job in this situation was to run everything right at the extreme. Uh, all the sails were tight and right. If you did it any more, they'd blow out. If you did it too less, uh, too little, the ship wouldn't go as fast and they wouldn't get away. And the whole thing you know anything about square rig sailing ships i mean the whole thing is this complex system of all kinds of sails and stuff and 
the ship was going down to these big troughs in, in the ocean and there was this description in this audio book that described how that the physics of how that worked how it was all tightly highly you know, sensitive to any kind of changes and the whole idea in um warfare they were shooting at each other well the whole idea of warfare is to try to generate an instability in that system that was so tightly wired up because if you hit one of the yards or the masts or the sails and put a hole in the sail it might split then the forces all switch and the whole thing comes on becomes unstable and then the ship starts doing things very rapidly that you can't control uh, and that was interesting to me because I'm an engineer. So I understood all of that. And it was uh, really quite an interesting kind of thing. So um, I liked that story enough that on a subsequent recent, when I, when I was going down to Florida to, to, uh, to Martin Armstrong's uh, conference, I uh, pulled out, the, pulled out the, uh, the disc and I put it in my car and I listened to it again. And cotton pick that there was no story about all the physics and everything. It wasn't there. And it's I did not make all of that up in my head. I heard it. And so I uh so I so I bought the book so that I could go and read in the book and see if it was in the book. It wasn't there either. So it really happens. Uh and it happened to me. It was there was no question about it. I mean, it was this rather lengthy little seg audio segment that explained how the whole thing kind of worked. And so, uh, uh, my guess, my guess is that it is like the cat in the Matrix, right, where he sees the black cat twice and says, "Those are the glitch in the Matrix." Um, what? What it contributes to is the notion and the possibility that we live in a simulation, which, of course, is the subject of a great deal of uh, study and theory um, by all kinds of people, including my friend Greg Braden. And uh, that the that this matrix, this uh, kind of contrived environment that we are all in, this video game, if you will, uh, you know, maybe we influence it some way that we don't understand, and so it replays itself in a different way. I, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, it's uh, certainly Terry. It seems real to me. So thanks. Come back. We'll see you again.